sabtu. So good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. We're just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join the link before we start. Before I hand over to Barbara, I'd just like to remind you guys of the housekeeping rules. So just to remind you all that this webinar is being recorded. There is an opportunity for you to put in questions in the Q using the Q&A box. If you do not want to be identified when your question is answered, then please tick the anonymous box so Barbara do not, doesn't identify you in her response. Um, and I'll hand over to Barbara if we can start. Thank you, Jo. And hello, everybody. Um, as ever, I'm sorry that we can't meet face to face and share the usual um, sandwiches and gossip afterwards. So we'll just have to use our imaginations to supply that. Um, I hope everyone's had as good a summer as, as is possible under the circumstances. Um, as you know, I'm going to talk today about what's been happening in relation to wills in the coronavirus crisis. And this is something I've spoken and written about on previous occasions. And as before, rather than providing notes accompanying this webinar, I will update my personal blog and will publish a link. And also, as Joe's just said, this webinar is going to be recorded. So you have that to refer to. So where are we? Um, about a month ago, on the 25th of July 2020, just before the end of the legal year and indeed the parliamentary year, and just as we were all about to start eating out to help out, thanks Rishi, um, the Ministry of Justice announced that at last it would be introducing legislation in September making changes to the attestation requirements in the Wills Act 1837. And this is something which, I'm, as I'm sure you all know, had been the subject of quite lengthy prediction and discussion really ever since the end of March and the beginning of lockdown restrictions and the exponential growth of coronavirus infections at that date. So this intended legislation it's going to be both temporary and retrospective and those are both quite novel features of the law and wills which otherwise properly has the same sort of long-lasting durability as wills themselves. So retrospective to the 31st of January 2020, which I think was the first coronavirus case in the UK, and it was around the time that the World Health Organization um, uh, announced that it was a, um, an international pandemic. Um, and its primary period, its sunset, will be <coughs> 31st of January 2022, but that period itself may be shortened or extended. So, <coughs> Not only are these two novel features of being both temporary and retrospective, but there's also, I mean, what struck me about the announcement, and I've been in quite close contact with Ian Bond of the Law Society's Trust and um, Equity Committee, who I know has been very deeply involved in the negotiations with the MOJ. I had obviously those negotiations were to a large extent confidential, but there were some things he was able to share privately with interested. Um, members of the profession. Um, I know that the negotiations were attracted. They took an enormous amount of hard work um, and discussion um, between the civil servants and the professional representatives who contributed to them. We are quite a long way behind uh, various other English speaking jurisdictions which have introduced similar legislation. And so there has been a model to follow. But nevertheless, we don't have we don't even have draft legislation yet. And I felt there's something rather like 
the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland in the sequence of events. If you remember, the Cheshire Cat has a grin that appears before the rest of its body does. The grin hovers above a tree branch rather disconcertingly, and then the rest of the Cheshire Cat appears and it disappears the same way. <coughs> Here we have the official announcement and some quite detailed published guidance on the government's website, and that's as authoritative as it goes, but we don't have the legislation itself or even the draft. And it's entirely unsurprising in the light of that Cheshire Cat appearance that um, STEP, uh, important professional body, urges its members to use, I quote, extreme caution in deciding whether or not to participate in remote witnessing before any legislation comes into force. And it recommends that such participation should be followed up by conventional signature and witnessing wherever possible. And that seems to me like extremely sound advice. So despite that, the actual change in the prospective legislation is relatively modest. And as I mentioned, it, it does closely resemble changes which have been brought into force in some cases um, as early as April in various other English speaking jurisdictions around the world. Um, they all um, have enabled some form of remote witnessing, remote execution and attestation, um, expanding our section nine of the Wills Act to accommodate both modern technology <coughs> and um, public health demands of self-isolation. Now, according to the Minister of Justice announcement, what's going to happen is that the Wills Act will be amended to state that the, quotes presence of testator and two witnesses is to include virtual presence via video link as an alternative alternative to physical presence. And as we know from very long decided cases like Casson and Dade in the 1780s, physical presence conventionally means within an actual sight line. And so with this change, when it comes into effect, we can leave Honora Jenkins, the testatrix in Casson and Dade, we can leave her behind in the 1780s, sitting in her coach outside the window of her solicitor's office and consider how the prospective change will work in an age of familiarity for many people rather wearying familiarity with meetings conducted by live video stream technology um, and you know for those who are interested in the nuts and bolts and the mechanics the actual form of the legislation looks likely to be a statutory instrument made under the electronic communications act 2000 and i'll confess that's an act i had to go and look up it wasn't at the forefront of my mind at all Delegated legislation has been a feature of much of the rulemaking throughout the coronavirus crisis. And you don't have to go very far on social media to find a public lawyer fulminating about this. And they do have a point. Um, it's relatively unsatisfactory that there's been a lack of parliamentary scrutiny of rules that have had an enormous impact on our, our, our daily lives. Um, the Coronavirus Act itself, which was rushed through Parliament in, our, in March, didn't make any provision for potential change to the Wills Act at all. And nor, you know, unsurprisingly, nor does the Wills Act 1837 contain any power to make subordinate legislation. That was a much less developed concept at that date. So the Electronic Communications Act, that was an act to make provision to facilitate the use of electronic com communications and data storage. And it provided in what it actually enacted in 2000 was the admissibility of electronic signatures and legal proceedings, but really more importantly for our purposes was its very significant enabling power. And that's a power in section eight of that act to modify the provisions of any enactment or subordinate legislation to authorize or facilitate the use of electronic communication for purposes and their various purposes which are defined and they include doing anything which is required to be done by a person's signature and is required to be witnessed. So that looks to be the mechanical route by which subordinate legislation can be laid before Parliament. And obviously that is going to be a much quicker process to bring something into law than to try and find time and energy um, in the parliamentary programme for primary legislation. Um, now, the Minister of Justice and the professional bodies who've been involved in negotiating this amendment and drafting the guidance all see this change as a last resort for making wills during a crisis, and they emphasise the desirability of compliance with the Wills Act as it stands. Now, my impression from reading and talking to um, 
solicitors involved with will making over the past few months is that many wills made under professional supervision have complied with the wills act people have gone to heroic lengths and some ingenuity to keep within the visual sightline rule um, although there have also been reported instances um, with your king particularly in bath um, there was quite a notable instance of their having used video technology in an emergency case um, coupled with the advice to clients to confirm instructions by making a wills act compliant will if possible in the event of recovering from a medical emergency so what will be required to comply with the new legislation um, well all we have to go on so far is the moj guidance Section 9 of the Wills Act is going to continue to apply. It's not going to be swept into irrelevance at all. Wills must be compliant with it. So your essential dramatis personae as in making the will and the two attesting witnesses. And it looks from the guidance that the proposed change is only going to apply to Section 9, the parts of Section 9, which is the beginning of Section 9A and then B and C, which deal with attestate a person making the will um, and their witnesses and not with the second limb of section 9a which is the testator directing someone to sign on their behalf it doesn't look as if the legislation's going to incorporate that extra persona as well and the way it's going to work is that video streaming the the technological concept of well not just the concept a reality of live video streaming is going to be introduced into the meaning of presence for the moment the testator signs the will or acknowledges his signature and um anora jenkins and her carriage is not completely obsolete because the person making the will and the two witnesses must still each have a clear line of sight of the writing of the signature and there must be physical wet signatures three of them uh one the testator two the witnesses um there's no uh provision for electronic signatures at all and what this means is that the witnesses must see the testator sign they can't attest a pre-recording so it's got to be a live recording and the testator must see the witnesses sign and that means there must be two separate live recordings so from the professional point of view that is two separate compliant legislation compliant video sessions to set up supervise record and manage the storage of those the the the, the ancillary tasks involved in compliance and it it's clear from the published guidance that any permutation of presence in separate locations is permissible for example you could have the test data and one of the witnesses together and the other one in a remote location you could have the test data separate and two witnesses in a remote location or you could have all three of them in separate locations obviously that adds a layer to the technology because you've got to have two live streams running but all of that is permissible and one thing that step have published their own briefing note of guidance on the same day that the Ministry of Justice published theirs and step guidance deals with something which the Ministry of Justice guidance doesn't but a very important thing again something I'm sure well if any of you have not had experience of this you're extraordinarily fortunate which is um, bandwidth and tech problems connections dropping out freezing uh, restarting those kinds of, pro of problems and the step guidance deals with that it recognizes the you know very great likelihood <coughs> that that sort of thing will happen um, and it suggests that if there is a break of any kind of freeze or a, or a, a loss of connection whilst either testator or witnesses are signing when it comes to their turn to sign what they should do is is having signed acknowledge by holding the will showing their signature holding it up to the camera and uh, that applies equally to testator and witnesses um, and that it's good practice to do this anyway because it's visual contact really at the point of acknowledgement which the law requires um, importantly there are two aspects of the objective legislation uh, sorry well there are two non-aspects there are two aspects of what you might expect to see in such a change which aren't going to be there and which are therefore non-compliant and it's important to to, to be aware that they're non-compliant one is electronic signatures they must all be wet signatures and the other is 
no possibility of executing counterpart documents. You can't have one physical document signed by testator, another physical document signed by witnesses. The MOJ thought there was just too much risk of fraud um, through multiplicity of documents. There's got to be one document, three signatures. Um, and all that the proposed change achieves is not requiring those three individuals to be in the same physical room or the same visual distance space at the same time. So the MOJ guidance uh, is divided into, into five stages and I'll go through each in turn. So stage one is set up and um, execution by testator. So you need to have your link set up and make sure that testator and witnesses can all see each other and can see each other. I mean, I think you can see me as head and shoulders, but for the purposes of, of a compliant video session, you need to see down on the desk as well and the, the hand moving across the paper. Um, again, with the, the, the extra safeguard of physically holding the document up with the signature on it afterwards. Um, and so the, the will maker should hold the front page of the will up and then turn to the signature page, hold that up and one thing they it's mentioned in the guidance but I would as part of these iterative stages but it seems to me and, I, and again to, to, to step a very important aspect of the um, a whole process, what the MOJ says, if the witnesses don't know the person making the will, they should ask for confirmation of identity, such as passport or driving license. I do think this is identity, ver sorry, identity verification is a very important aspect of the process. And indeed, it's emphasized and amplified in some of the comparative legislation around the world, where there are requirements for um, all the participants to, to, to exchange or lodge in some way. Um, some form of identity verification, because clearly it's important to eliminate risks of impersonation and there's nothing specific in the guidance to address the risk of um, what are called deep fakes, which can be made using video technology. And we may think it's something quite far-fetched and audacious that a person would do such thing. But I mean, as all of you who deal, certainly those of you who deal professionally with wills disputes will know, um, even with conventional technology, there are very few limits to what is far-fetched and audacious in what people will try on in terms of fraudulent wills. So I have no doubt that there will be attempts at deep fakes and that's why some form of identity ver verification is, is very important. So stage two is the witnesses. They should confirm, they can see and hear, acknowledge and understand their role in witnessing the signing of a legal document. And I'll say a bit more about this later, but their role really is no more than to be there to see what they have to see, which is the testator signing, and to sign themselves. It is not an expanded notarial role. They don't have to verify anything for themselves. They don't have to do any kind of capacity assessment or undue influence verification. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Um, the guidance says ideally they should be physically present with each other, but if that's not possible, they must be present at the same time by way of a two or three way video link. Stage three. Now this is, this is the stage which actually protracts the process of uh, completing a legally valid will um, because it's, it's where the physical document travels from testator to testing witnesses. The MOJ idea, it says it should be ideally within 24 hours and that it must be the same document as I mentioned, you can't have a counterpart. Um, and they do say a longer period of time may be unavoidable. And again, it'll be interesting to see what the legislation says. Um, and there's obviously a potential trap for people who um, follow this guidance now, but find that it falls foul of the legislation as and when enacted. Um, and with a degree of sort of galumphing self-evidentness, they say it should be borne in mind that the longer the process takes, the greater the potential for problems to arise. Um, no shit, Sherlock. Um, the obvious potential problem is because, as they say, the will's only fully validated when all three signatures are on it. If the testator dies before 
it's been delivered to the witnesses and their signature has been added, it's not valid. And of course, the most likely set of circumstances in which someone is going to want to make um, a will in this way is one of extreme medical urgency. So that must be an absolutely patent risk um, and one which I suspect you know, may be mitigated, certainly not by shoving it in a post box, but by ensuring perhaps that the witnesses, I mean, one can imagine a hospital scenario where perhaps the witnesses are, are um, or care home scenario where the witnesses are, are present in the building, but not in the same room and it can be physically taken to them immediately or where they're a bit further away, where it's couriered to them. Um, but the clearly the urgency may very well be absolutely critical. Stage four, that's the witnesses signing um, and that's a second video session and um, both the MOJ and, and, and STEP suggest you might want to introduce a different form of attestation clause to make it that, that one that reflects pretty closely what has been done and the video technology um, has been used and the MOJ is say the session should be recorded if possible and I imagine that's guidance everyone would want to follow. Stage five, if the two witnesses aren't physically present with each other, well, that's just repeating stage four um, simultane simultaneously um, for the, the two witnesses to comply. And finally, there's the suggestion I've already mentioned, which is tweaking the attestation clause the so it reflects what has actually gone on. <coughs> so that's what's in the guidance. Step, as I say, have published a briefing note on the same day on the execution of wills using video witnessing. And um, quite rightly for a professional body, they are very alive to the negatives, the potential <laughs> downsides of, of using this, this facility. Um, and they start by emphasising that it really does create a greatly increased risk of challenge to the validity of a will, not just on all the grounds we're already familiar with, but obviously there could be a challenge arising from the failure to follow new, the new procedure correctly. And that's a particularly acute challenge when that procedure is not yet in official form. Um, they also draw attention to something which, again, um, Brian Sloan at Cambridge University has written a, a a note on on the changes uh, law faculty property blog and he's drawn attention to this as well and that's confidentiality issues because again as we all know whether from practice or from law school um all that the testator has to do when interacting with the witnesses in a conventional situation is is indicate that the document that he has signed and they're being asked to put their signatures to in attestation is a will. The um, witnesses do not have to see the entire document and they don't have to know what's in it. The will's sort of inherently confidential to the person who makes it until it, until it goes to probate. Um, now, where you have a scenario where the document signed by the testator is being sent to the witnesses, well, a very highly principled and self-disciplined witness might just cast their eye to the last page and um, put their signature on it whilst on the video live stream. But most people are going to have a read through, it's human nature. Um, and although the law as it stands precludes any beneficiary or beneficiary spouse from being an attesting witness, and there's no proposal to change that, there's still, there's a, um, that still leaves open a large pool of potentially eligible attesting witnesses who might very well have views about what's in the will on behalf of, of a, say, a child or a sibling. Um, so these are people who are quite eligible to be attesting witnesses under the law, but for whom it may just be undesirable to let those individuals see or have the opportunity to see what's in the will. So what this comes down to is giving some thought and care to selection or of attesting witnesses and step very much encourage, unsurprisingly, that um, 
where their members are involved, whoever has drafted the will should be one of the witnesses and should be responsible for providing the other. And of course, that's a very familiar scenario when execution takes place in the solicitor's office. It'll be um, a, a, a colleague or an assistant or a, a secretary, although they're somewhat of a, a dying breed these days, um, but somebody else in the office um, who will be the second attesting witness. And um, where... A, a, Obviously, we, we can't reach, there's nothing we as professionals can do really to, to reach the, the home, homemade will makers, other than, you know, by happenstance, they may read published guidance in a blog or on a professional website, but, but by definition, they're not, they're not offering any, they're not seeking any professional guidance, professional retainer, or professional supervision. So I've sort of excluded them from view, as it were, but within the the world of professional retainer, there are the wills where the supervision of execution is actually carried out under the eye, as it were, of whoever drafted the will, and as I say, very often in, in their office. And there are also the cases where the will is sent out with instructions for execution, and there have been some cases about um, negligence arising from that. Um, and of course, anything which you don't supervise yourself, there's always a possibility of people not doing not doing it the right way um and i think there's particular focus here if that is what's what's happening if if the witnesses are not really if they're rem both remote and as in physically remote and not connected to the professional who supervised the drafting the execution of the will then very important that they should have the most accurate guidance possible um, so that they do it right um, another thing that STEP has given more attention to than the Minister of Justice is the risk of fraud at stage four, which is where the witnesses uh, are attesting. And that's the possibility that when they receive the physical will, that they would substitute pages of it. Again, um, far-fetched and audacious, but as we know, that's the sort of thing people do. And so STEP make the very sensible suggestion that um, the testator should initial or sign each page and that obviously provides a, a, a quick check for that sort of thing. So that's the gist of, of the guidance on the legislation which we're yet to see. September, which is fast approaching, is the projected date for it to come into existence to be laid before Parliament. But really, who knows? Things are very unpredictable. Um, the political calendar is very full and very turbulent. So I think one has to just keep a, a beady eye on um, the, the MOJ website and on its press releases. Um, one question that I think has been shown thrown into quite sharp relief by the gestation of these changes is what's the value of attestation by two witnesses? Um, traditionally, the requirement of physical presence, visual sightline, and two witnesses was to protect the testator from fraud. It's, it's a rule that, that predates the 1837 Wills Act. So it's a protection from fraud, from um, interposition of fraudulent documents and fraudulent people. And, but it's also recognised as providing some degree of safeguard against wills being made by incapacitated testators or subject to the undue influence of someone else. Now, there's no explicit requirement, either in the Wills Act or in any of these proposed amendments to it, for a witness to consider these potential vitiating circumstances and make any kind of declaration or certification about either of them. And I always, I'm always struck by the contrast between that position and that under the uh, Mental Capacity Act, where uh, when lasting powers of attorney were created under that act, um, they introduced the role of a certificate provider who's much closer to a kind of continental notary. The certificate provider's got an active duty to put their name on the line, as it were, they, that they have considered and satisfied themselves that the person making the instrument has got sufficient mental capacity to make it and is not subject to fraud or undue pressure. And we know that wills, I mean, this is particularly true of homemade wills, but also those which have been professionally drafted, but not executed under professional supervision, 
they're quite often witnessed by strangers or near strangers in a fairly perfunctory way. And there's, there's a knowledge and approval case of about a decade ago called Hart and Dabs, where there were tremendously suspicious circumstances, but the suspicion was dispelled by the evidence of the attesting witnesses. But the attesting witnesses really didn't know the testator at all, if I remember correctly. Um, they were a husband and wife who ran a village shop and they perhaps knew him slightly by, by sight. And it really was the most perfunctory occasion, but their evidence was pivotal to the knowledge and approval case and I don't think that's an uncommon scenario at, at all. Um, so you have a pretty perfunctory occasion and the witnesses don't know the test data well, um, perhaps don't have, they're not observant enough or there aren't clues evident at the time that there might be a question of capacity or undue influence in the background. Now these prospective changes in the new legislation, they're not going to impose any greater burden of inquiry on witnesses than the Wills Act does or any anything remotely resembling the um, lasting power of attorney requirement of certification. But the MOJ guidance states that the person making the will must be acting with capacity and in the absence of undue influence and suggests that the whole process should be recorded and the recording retained and I quote as this may assist a court in the event of a will being challenged both in terms of whether the will was made in a legally valid way but also to try and detect any indication of undue influence fraud or lack of capacity and the step briefing note goes further and it stresses the difficulty um, of assessment of capacity and freedom of undue influence where the person responsible for drafting the will and taking the instructions is themselves remote and it contains various more detailed recommendations to underscore the need for alertness and for scrutiny and ultimately for declining to act as a witness if the if the person who's being asked to do so it feels unable to mitigate the risks of lack of capacity and undue influence. And I think that's that's an acutely difficult problem if it arises in real life, because um, freedom of testation and the ability to put your testamentary wishes into a legally valid form is an incredibly important freedom um, of which people shouldn't be deprived. And I think this, this actually puts quite a burdensome onus on professionals who are asked to be involved. Um, it is more difficult for them to satisfy themselves of capacity and lack of undue influence and I if I myself was in that situation I'd be I'd be very reluctant to decline unless my suspicions were very strong indeed um, and again unsurprisingly step recommend taking a comprehensive attendance note not just relying on video recordings and supervising the execution process itself so that's the where we are in terms of what is proposed and where the professional guidance is on it. A few important points to note. Um, obviously, a very significant number of wills have been executed since the 31st of January. Um, the majority of them, I anticipate, certainly those made under professional supervision, will be unquestionably wills at compliant. What, what might be excluded? Well, some much more likely to be homemade wills where an, a video attempt has been made, but it doesn't comply with um, the legislation as and when it comes into force. And I don't know, but that might, might also apply to some professionally supervised wills as, as well, but I'm sure the majority of those which are going to be in questionable, questionable compliance with video presence will be homemade wills. Um, but also the guidance says any wills of which a grant of probate has already been issued or in respect of which the application, which I assume means the application for probate, is already being administered. Well, that's not a very important exception because by definition, a will of which a grant of probate has already been issued has been accepted as valid by the probate registry and the more uncertain ones are those where there's an application for probate in processing and it would be unfortunate if um, I think it's extremely unlikely, but if there was a will which could potentially be validated under the new legislation, um, but is removed from it because an application for probate is being made. So probably the lesson there is if you have, if you have one which you think might be compliant with the Cheshire Cat legislation we haven't yet seen, 
don't apply for probate until you have a sight of the draft legislation. So, in conclusion, is everyone happy? Inevitably, the answer to this is no, because it usually is the answer to the question, is everyone happy? Um, from conversations I've had, there are solicitors who believe that any departure from the Wills Act as it stands is too great a relaxation of safeguards against fraud. And there are campaigners who would like legislation to provide for wills which don't require paper and electronic signature at all. Um, and so this legislation is, this, this amendment is something of a middle way, but it's important to remember it is only temporary and it's going to be followed by fuller consideration of the work done by the Law Commission in 2017, which is tremendously important groundwork for any change. Ultimately, that's going to bring forward primary legislation making a permanent change. Now, when I was giving talks about the Law Commission's project in 2017, I think my working title for those was a Wills Act 2020. Well, it's late August 2020, there is not going to be a Wills Act 2020. But perhaps there'll be a Wills Act 2025, or whatever the date of its ultimate enactment. I anticipate that that will give effect to a more significant and a more wide-ranging lasting departure from the Wills Act 1837, including quite possibly and very significantly a dispensing power, um, many other legislations with comparable will formalities or from the, which have started from the same point as the English legislation contain similar powers. And these are powers which permit a court to validate a will which has been made in an informal way. And one very well known example is a very sad case of a man who, who was on the brink of suicide and left a, a text message, an unsent text message on his phone, which was found after his death. It's a case called Green Nickel, decided in Queensland in 2017 and held to be valid. And the, the, the crunch in all of these cases is um, finding testamentary intention, and that is a judicial task. Um, Although I think a dispensing power, it's a very, it's a very important, it's a game changing development where it's been introduced in legislation. And I think it is very likely we will have one here. Um, it is, it's something which brings in judicial involvement. It brings in litigation. And of course, that in itself is a very double edged thing. Um, the cost and uncertainty lit to litigants in challenging and upholding wills, which ultimately the aim of a law of formalities should be to be such as can be reasonably easily complied with um, and in a way which reduces rather than promotes challenges. But all of that lies in the future. Okay, well, that's all that I was going to say, and I can see I've got two questions in the Q&A, so let me just have a look at those. Um, Khalid Mahmood has asked me, can only the last page of the will be sent for witnessing? So this will solve the problem of showing the full document. It's a good question. It's one I had, um, had considered myself. Um, I would say for the safe, sake of safety, not, because the guidance doesn't say anything about only sending the last page. And of course, it, that might raise the question of um, whether there had been some interference, some interposition of pages afterwards. So I would wait and see what the legislation says, and in the meantime, um, choose witnesses carefully and send the entire document. But um, I'm interested in other views. I don't know if anyone agrees or dissents with that. Um, second question, anonymous question. On a positive note, might this change allow a professional such as a private client solicitor to send a final will to the, wit to the testator, witness the test testator signed via video, video link, ask them to return the signed will as soon as possible, and then arrange a second video call during which the solicitor and a colleague both sign as witnesses with the testator acknowledging their signature. That arrangement may assist some testators who would have concerns about arranging their own witnesses, e.g. confidentiality and familiarity, if they're unable to attend the solicitor's office in person. I can think of clients who'd value the flexibility of such an arrangement. I agree. Um, I think provided it's all done in compliance with, for now, the guidance and in due course, the legislation, um, then 
um, I, I can see that that will overcome some testators mind obstacles to um, getting on with and completing the, the, the process. So I, 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 I'm interested to read that um, you know of clients who value the flexibility of such an arrangement and others of you may find exactly the same thing. Um, third, anonymous question. If the testator loses capacity between signing and witnessing, would the testator watching the screen be, be sufficient? I think this is a very interesting question. Again, it's one I've given some thought to because the, the law as it stands on, um, well, th there's, there's laws that stands on um, declining capacity between giving instructions and then execution. And that even if there has been a, a, a degradation of, of capacity, such as that the testator might not be able to give instructions for a will now, but can understand that it was the will they gave instructions for, it's valid. That's just like garbled paraphrase of what the law says. Um, I, I do think this, this question is highly relevant and, and not academic in a context where almost certainly you're looking at somebody ill and deteriorating. Um, I don't think watching the screen would be sufficient. I think there would have to be some bespoke capacity test um, echoing that, um, which I've just described, that at the moment of witnessing, does the testator have capacity to understand that the witnesses are putting their signature to a will which he has witnessed, even, even if the testator can no longer pass banks and good fellow at the moment of the witnesses testing, can he understand what they're doing? But I must stress this is complete on the hoof speculation on my part and a question which I fear will be explored in litigation um, at some point. Uh, right, let me just scroll down because um, I have some more questions. Uh, Rita Carr, what will happen if testator dies in between him signing the will and the will signed by witnesses? Not valid. That's, that is a, a problem that's foreseen in the published guidance and the MAJs say the will is only complete once the witnesses have signed. Um, so it's rather like, and I've been involved in one or two of these cases, and they really, they're quite emotionally affecting, even if you're only a professional involved and you're not in, in the room with a dying person, but I've been involved in at least two statutory will cases where the court has been asked to make an urgent statutory will order and has done so, and the person in question has, has died. One was in, we got a message in the course of the hearing that the person had died. The other, um, they died before, uh, within an hour, of a hearing concluding before a draft could be taken to them to sign. So it's rather similar to that. And um, it's, it's an unhappy state of affairs. And as I say, if you think there's a risk of that, do not put the will in the post box, um, but make arrangements as far as possible for the most urgent physical delivery of the document as soon as it left the testator's hands into the witnesses. Um, Sorry, just scrolling down. Anonymous that indeed. Does the new legislation also raise the question of whether the witnesses need to be present together? Obviously, this would not be advisable if time was of the essence, but again, could allow testators flexibility to choose witnesses more carefully. Again, this is a good question. Um, just going back to what the guidance says about stage five. Um, Stage four, as I mentioned, is the witnesses, the attestation, signing the will document. Um, and it's important the testator sees both the witnesses sign and acknowledges that they've seen them sign. Um, and stage four is guidance in the scenario where the two witnesses are together. Stage five, if the two witnesses are not physically present with each other, so the guidance certainly contemplates they won't be present with each other, um, then you need step four twice. In both cases, ensuring the testator and the other witness can clearly see and follow what's happening. So they don't have to be physically present together, but there still has to be 
a visual connection between the two witnesses. Um, the guidance says, while it's not a legal requirement for the two witnesses to sign in the presence of each other, it is good practice. So uh, we don't know, as I keep stressing, we don't know exactly what the legislation is going to say, but I would follow that guidance as far as possible. Okay, well, um, that is all the questions I've had. Um, if anyone else has one, please do add it now. If not, what I will do, as I say, is update my, my blog, um, Realistic Lew It Before Monday Morning, and um, I will publish that, link to it, we'll link to it via Chamber's website and via our Twitter feed, and likewise the recording of this session. So thank you all very much for attending, and I hope it's been some use to you. And thank you, Joe, as always, for uh, technical support and setting everything up.